I'm Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is made in collaboration with The Jewish Journal. Breakdown of the Palestinian refugee problem in 20 seconds. The year is 1947 and the UN announces its partition plan for Palestine, also known as Resolution 181. Promptly, the Arabs residing in the region open fire on Jews. Eventually, a war breaks out and exodus, and the exodus of 700,000 Palestinians ensues. Maybe it was a little less than 20 seconds. This has turned into one of the most controversial debates in modern history. What caused the Palestinian exodus of the years 1947 to 1949? There's the mainstream Zionist narrative, more or less, that Arab leaders urged the Arab population to leave. There's the mainstream Arab narrative, basically Zionist and th- ethnic cleansing. And then there's Professor Be- Benny Morris. Now buckle in because this is slightly more nuanced than the stuff you might be used to hearing. Professor Benny Morris is the Professor Emeritus of History in the Middle East Studies Department of Ben Gurion University. He's the author of several books, as you can see, uh, including The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, 1947 and 1949, and also the book 1948. And he's a pretty cool dude. So we are thrilled to be joined by him in his home this evening to talk about some history. So let's get started maybe with uh, a term that others have used to coin you, which is uh, a new historian. How do you... It actually was a, a term I coined. Ah, old, old historiography, new historiography, old historians, new historians. What's that about? And that was a sort of a definitions in, in which I coined, I suppose, in 1988 in an article which was published in Tikkun in America, in which I said that the historians, more or less, uh, Israeli historians from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, basically pervade an old official Zionist historiography. And in the 1980s, with the opening of new archives and um, uh, the the attainment of maturity by a, a younger generation of historians, new historiography, which meant revisionist historiography, had come into its own and was being published. And so mm-hmm. there was this divide between the, the old and the new, which, of course, the old, uh, old-timers didn't like. And what was the old-timer, I guess, basic history of well, the, the founding Well, the basic history was the Jews were right, the Arabs were wrong, the Jews were good, the Arabs were bad. We came here with goodwill so in our right, heart. The right history. Yeah, we, we came, no, well, it was the left wing also which pervaded this. We came here to establish a nice state among Arab neighbors. They didn't uh, react nicely to us, and eventually they started killing us, and uh, we had to defend ourselves, and uh, uh, one of the byproducts of that was a creation of a large Palestinian refugee problem. And how did mm-hmm. you rebel against that? Paradigm? Well, uh, b- basically, we looked at the documentation. It was me and uh, some other p- other historians, Avi Schleim and so on. We looked at the documents, which had never been opened, hadn't been opened before the 1980s. And uh, that showed a more nuanced um, um, picture of what had happened in the d- years pre- pre- before 1948 and in 1948 and in the years following 48. And the nuanced picture showed the Jews sometimes did nasty things as well. The Arabs did nasty things. Uh, sometimes the Jews acted wisely. Sometimes the Arabs were unwise. Um, um, uh, so it sort of changed somewhat the picture, uh, which had been sold to the Israeli public and Israeli school children during the previous 40 years. So let's hone in a little bit on the <coughs> Palestinian refugee problem. And uh, and then maybe later we'll get to your upcoming. Which is a book. bit passé because I wrote about it thirty yeah. years ago. Yeah, but we yeah. but it's new for our audience, so we want to try and uh, okay. br- and break it down for them. It's still relevant. Because, it's because, still relevant. I'm yeah. For, yeah, I think that I think it's a, it'll be news to a lot of people. I think that when I was first introduced to not too long ago to to your lectures, um, I had for years actually believed the idea that. Arabs had urged Jews to leave their uh, homes, and then they would, you Arabs know, promise. Had urged Arabs. Arabs, sorry, Arabs had urged Arab Arabs. Arab leaders had urged Arabs. Yeah. Had urged Arabs to leave their homes on the promise that they would return to, you know, a conquered uh, homeland. Yeah, um, and that, that apparently not is not. It's essentially not true. It's essentially not true. Um, Arab leaders from outside, the Arab leaders uh, of the states, the Arab states around Palestine, Israel, uh, did not urge. 
the Palestinian Arabs to leave. If anything, quite the opposite happened in May 1948. They essentially told the Arabs of Palestine, stay in your places, or even if you've left, go back to your places on penalty of uh, arrest, uh, um, confiscation of your property if you leave it, and so on. Um, and the leaders of the Palestinian national movement also essentially didn't encourage flight. Um, al Husseini issued in March 48 uh, orders to people to stay. They were, people asked him, what shall we do? And no, notables from Tiberias and Jerusalem. And he said, no, no, stay in your places, don't leave. So it's essentially a myth, the whole business. But every myth has a core of reality in it, of truth. And it's true that in some places, Arabs did urge other Arabs to leave. In Haifa, the local no notables who had remained in Haifa in April 1948 uh, did call on their remaining uh, populace in, in Haifa to evacuate because staying there would have meant accepting Jewish rule, essentially legitimizing Jewish control of Haifa mm -hmm. uh, and their acceptance of Jewish control. So they told them leave. Probably uh, uh, behind the scenes they said, well, eventually you'll be able to come back when the Arab armies come and conquer this place. You'll be able to come back on the uh, coattails of Arab conquering Arab soldiers. But... but um, uh, that usually wasn't stated in public. Um, and there were other places, villages along the coastal plain near Jerusalem, in which the elders in the village or the militiamen in the village told the women and children to evacuate because they didn't want the burden of protecting the women and children uh, in combat zones. Uh, uh, so they said, well, leave. And that, of course, contributed to the um, creation of the Palestinian refugee problem because it had a, an effect which they didn't, hadn't considered. If you tell your women and children to leave, they leave, and then you have less to stay for. You, the fighters and mm -hmm. the young men, right. have less reason to stay because you don't have to defend anybody. So mm -hmm. you leave more easily than had they remained. So, so, but it worked that way. So there, and there were certain villages which were instructed to leave also by Arab commanders, uh, Egyptian commanders, Jordanian, for tactical reasons. They didn't want villagers uh, caught up in the middle, uh, pray, you know, uh, um, uh, as an obstacle to their own plans to, to you know, advance or whatever. Uh, but essentially, people left. And, and there were places, of course, where Israeli troops did expel Arabs. And there's no argument about that, certainly not after the revelation. But it, of, was it anecdotal or was it significant? No, no, it was significant. It's not uh, marginal. There were, um, from Lida and Ramle in July 1948, something over 50,000 uh, Arabs were expelled. They were told to leave. You've got a couple of hours, get on the road and go to Abdullah. Was it Jordan. illegal, though? What do you mean, illegal? I mean, is it considered... Was it policy? Is it considered a war crime in international I law? I don't know. Look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not okay. a lawyer. I okay. don't know what's okay. a war crime and what isn't. If you line up 100 people on the, next to a wall and shoot them, that's a crime. I don't have to yeah. be a lawyer to understand that. But whether if you expel a population from a place which has attacked you or is about to attack you or is behind your front line and you can't endanger your front line because they're on your lines of communication, is that legal or not? I don't know. It, it's not really okay. relevant. But there were expulsions by Israeli troops uh, of Arabs in 1948, the most prominent being Lida and Ramle, with Ben-Gurion's authorization, direct, uh, immediate authorization. We have the command. Yeah, gave. Rabin said he told us expel them, or he said with a gesture, meaning expel them. So there is no expel one them. document to that? We no, there's like a series of documents. There's do documents, there's Rab what Rabin said, there's documents at the time in which Rabin tells uh, the local commanders orders them expel the population of Lida and Ramla, man, woman, and child, and then tell me you've done it. And then the, the local commander uh, of the Iftah Brigade cables them a day later, says we're expelling them, and a day later says we've completed the expulsion. So we've got the whole uh, documentation what I mean of the is, whole thing. Sorry for being pushy about it, but it's really interesting. Is there? A written, signed document by Ben Gurion no. ordering. No. There is no. You're such. talking about a, doc a document saying expel the Arabs from Palestine. For example. No, there was never okay. such, pol such a policy. The po there was it's never a overall policy, as the Arabs later maintained, of expelling the Palestinians. That wasn't government policy. Was never decided in cabinet. Was never decided in the Jewish Agency executive before. Was never decided by the chiefs of staff or the general staff of the IDF or the Haganah before them. Uh, so there was no policy, but there was a, an atmosphere from April 48. Let's get rid of as many as we can, get rid in the sense of getting them out of the country um, so that they won't be a bother to us militarily while the war continues and politically and militarily after the war ends. 
they won't be a potential fifth column. So it's better to have as few Arabs as possible. But it was never translated into official policy, which meant Ben-Gurion hinted and winked and told some generals as few as remain as possible, and some generals accepted it, and some didn't act accordingly, and we have at the end of the war a fifth of Israel's population is Arab, 160,000 Arabs, 700,000 Jews in the state of Israel 1949. As right. a result of no policy, they leave a lot of Arabs in place. So it was kind of up to the discretion of generals on the ground. In more the or less, more or less, yes. I see. And uh, Generals and even lower, usually it's colonels and majors and ca- uh, uh, captains. In other words, company commanders and battalion commanders and brigade commanders. They're the ones who in the end decide what to do about the population. And later, Israeli officials come and visit the Galilee, and they basically fume and say, they write documents saying... They, some places they kicked out the Muslims, some places they left them, some places they kicked out Christians. Chaos. Yes, chaos, exactly. Everybody did what they felt like. So let's, let's make some order of this because I want to understand it kind of – because I feel like it's ha- ha- neither here nor there. It's like a bit of everything happened. That's what history is like. Yeah, yeah. It's not usually 100 so, you know, straightforward. So what kind of – in what stages did it happen and what amounts left when? Do we know that? We, I, I, in my books, I, I more or less um, – um, chronologized it. I I explained what what the stages were, and there were sort of four stages in the creation of the problem, in the departure of the Palestinian Arabs from their homes, most of them incidentally ending up in other parts of Palestine, not outside Palestine. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're not even refugees. A refugee is defined as somebody who leaves his country, not his home, uh, to move to another part of the Mm -hmm. same country. But anyhow, uh, there was an initial stage which is important between November 47 and March 1948 in which the upper class of the Palestinian people, uh, essentially upper class of Jaffa, Haifa, Jerusalem, fled with their families. And this sort of left the Palestinian Arabs who remained the bulk of the Palestinian Arabs leaderless because the, the political nation, the upper class, had departed. The lawyers, the doctors, the politicians, uh, the, the, the military commanders, most of them had fled by the end of March. Um, The second stage uh, was a mass departure during April, May, June, in which something like 200,000 or 300,000 Arabs fled their homes. Um, And then there was a third stage during a series of Israeli uh, military offensives in uh, July 1948, in which some of them were from Lida and Ramla who were expelled. Others fled from the Nazareth area, not being expelled, but fled. Um, when Israel conquered these areas. And then there was a a fourth stage in October-November when Israel Israel went over to the offensive both in the Galilee and in the south, and another two, three hundred thousand essentially uh, were pushed out of their homes by military pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Here and there, there was advice by Egyptian colonels telling the people in Ashdod or Isdud to leave, but essentially it was because they were being attacked by Israeli troops, their homes and villages, and, and, and so they fled. Nobody wants to get killed by falling shells. It's, it's Those are the four stages. So how yeah. many How many are we talking about? 700,000 is a rough estimate. Nobody knows exactly how many. The Arabs at the time said a million had been expelled. Israel said 500,000. The UN said 700,000 plus, and that's probably the number. That's, though, historically speaking, it's not an uncommon thing when we look at wars throughout the 20th century. Let's wars say, which right? involve civilian populations, uh, you end up with a, a, a civilian flight, Uh, Usually, or not usually, I'm not even sure if it's true usually, but often civilians are allowed back. When Paris is taken by the Germans, as the Germans are about to capture uh, Paris in May, June 1940, five million Parisians or Frenchmen around the Paris area flee southwards, but almost all of them return to Paris. The difference here is that Israel from June 1948 onwards, and this is consistent, unlike no policy before that, but from June onwards, there is a, a government policy not to allow refugees to return. Right. And that's implemented along the borders. In other words, you shoot people who try to cross it back into Israel. I can't help but remembering I heard an interview with Rafi Eitan, who was a commander right at the 48 war. And then he was chief of uh, Mossad, and he used to say... No, no, Rafi Eitan... He wasn't chief of Mossad, no, he wasn't. but he was in the Mossad. You're talking about uh, Rafi Amastria. Rafa- no. Rafi uh, Amastria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rafael Eitan is another guy who was the chief of staff R- of the army. But his name Raful. is... Ra- but, his na- uh, but Rafi Eitan. Yeah, there's two, ra- two, there's Rafi. two yeah, Rafael yeah, yeah. Eitans. So One Rafi of them was Eitan. in the Mossad for a yeah, while. Okay. And, and, uh, so Rafi ahead. Eitan, who was also in the Eichmann kidnapping... Yes, exactly. He, used, he said in the interview... 
what a mistake we did. We should have pushed more out. So many of that generation, I think, also felt that way. And, and like you said, regretted in a way. And in a sense, ironically, lots of the things that's, that there is going on now, you can draw a line from those decisions made by, back then by these middle-class soldiers and what is happening today in our geopolitics. And it's mind-blowing yeah, to no, think you can, about you it. You can say that if Israel's Arabs had not remained in Israel, and if the West Bank Arabs and Gaza Arabs had not remained in the West Bank and Gaza but had crossed the Jordan in 1948, Life things, would, would, be things would have been less complicated for Israel and perhaps even easier for the Palestinians in some way. Also, but that's not how it ended up. Yeah, and you also, I read some quotes from you saying about the current uh, Arab, Palestinian, Israeli citizens about how our relationship with them is so complicated and some rough quotes. Do you still stand behind the... And I don't, I've never changed my mind on things. Um, I change my mind about things if I see documents which show me the opposite of what right. I said before. And I haven't encountered that. Um, what I said is that Israel's Palestinian um, minority especially insofar as it identifies with the Palestinian national cause, which essentially is to get rid of Israel, um, are a potential fifth column. They, were the, they have been since 1948 and remain so. Um, some of them have become Israelified, some of them have become westernized, but in general they somehow identify, and it's natural if you like, with their brothers across the line in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the, the uh, refugee camps in Lebanon, Syria, and whatever. And these people want to get back from the refugee camps, they want to come back to their homes and lands in Palestine, and essentially the Palestinian people believe we are a set of robbers who've taken their lands and houses, and we should get out and they should be restored to their lands and houses, uh, and they should be sovereign in all of Palestine. That's essentially the Palestinian ethos and the Palestinian desire. It's said openly by the Hamas, not so openly by the Fatah, but this is what they would like. And Benny Morris of 1986, 7, 8 would say the same thing? Or yes. The same thing? Yes. That's so interesting, because I read about your life story. And no, it's, it's, I've always been a Zionist. I've always believed we should have a state here, but I've always understood the Palestinians want us to get out of here. They want to uproot us. I think what Noah is getting at is a lot of people kind of, and I'm sure you've seen this, say Benny Morris went through a conversion. Yeah, it's not true. You don't feel <laughs> okay. that way. Well, what I would say is this. I would say that in the 1990s, when Arafat seemed to be inching towards, as the head of the PLO, seemed to be inching towards a settlement, a two-state settlement, an agreement to partition the country with a Jewish state next to an Arab state, and he signed the Oslo Accords and uh, supposedly recognized Israel's existence or legitimacy, uh, it appeared that maybe they were changing their colors, that they were changing their tune, that they were, were bowing to reality and would accept a two-state solution. When in, in 2000, uh, in summer 2000 at Camp David, he said no. Essentially, he was continuing the line of Palestinian resistance since 37 of continuously saying no to a two-state solution, to a compromise. He was essentially saying, it's all ours. We're not going to give any part of it to you or not legitimize mm -hmm. any part of it belonging to the Jewish people. And, and from that point on, you had the Second Intifada and you've got Palestinian rejectionism continuing under Olmert, I, when, uh, under uh, Abbas when he said no to Olmert's similar peace offering, uh, the uh, Clinton parameters and the, the Olmert um, uh, proposals, which are also for a two-state solution. He also said no. So this has been a consistent Palestinian line. So what I'm saying is I understood the depths, and partly because when I wrote this book, Righteous Victims, I came to understand the depth of Palestinian rejectionism. The, the, that book sort of follows the conflict from its origins through the first half of the, uh, 19, uh, the 20th century. And, and you, when you read what they're saying and doing during those 50 years, from 1880 until 1948, uh, you come to understand why they're saying the same things in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Why? Mm -hmm. They don't want us here. We, they think we are robbers. They believe we've stolen their land, and they want it back. And they think that's justice. From the late... 19th century. Yes, yes. From the beginning, from 1890, um, Palestinian notables, and they weren't considered Palestinian then, they were southern Syrian Arabs who lived in Palestine in this area, they sent petitions to uh, 
in Istanbul to the capital of the Ottoman Empire asking the Sultan to stop Jewish immigration to Palestine, to stop Jewish land purchases in Palestine because they're coming here to dispossess us. They understood, they believed and understood, if you like, that this is what was going to happen if Zionism expanded. And it worked out that they were right. Yeah. It was a self, self-fulfilling self prophecy. Yeah, quite amazing, the prophecy. Well, it's... no, they understood. Look, they had they had been influenced by anti-Semitic views of the Jews. And the anti-Semites in England, America, Russia, said the Jews are out to conquer the world. Is this, the, you know, like a... Um, a tamnun, a, um, an, octopus. an octopus enveloping the world. These right. rabbis control Moscow and eventually control the Communist Party, and they control the ca- uh, capital that is rich, the rich West through New York and the Stock Exchange, and they want to conquer the world. And so the, the Arabs in Palestine, who didn't know too much, but they'd heard that the Jews are all powerful, they're coming here and taking over. And this is a real danger. It's not a couple of 10,000 settlers or 20 or 30,000. They are the, the, the point. The, the, the spear point of a vast movement. They didn't know there were only 10 million Jews in the world at the time. They probably thought there were hundreds of millions, and they're all powerful. They'll come here, they'll throw us out. So for them, it was like discovering the boogeyman's real. Yes. Well, they, this is the boogeyman, and eventually it turned into <laughs> real. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting, though, that you, you – because it seems like the, the, the research ventures you go on are kind of – I mean, you say that you understand this this issue with the Palestinians, um, I guess, not accepting Israeli sovereignty and wanting, seeing us as robbers. And, and, and I, I mean, maybe this is too much of an assumption, but that you see that as a problem in a certain civil society. But you still kind of make a point of it to, to, to research their claims and you name Rationale. the book Righteous Victims, which is interesting that you Well, Righteous Victims in, in the book, and it's not spelt out, but most people understand it refers to both sides. Uh, okay, the victims are both sides. The Jews are victims of the outside world, but anti-Semitism and so on and yeah. end up coming here because of that, not because they yeah. want to dispossess somebody, but they want to possess something. Still, they don't do it, Yeah, it's still so, though. It's, it's but interesting. the Arabs are also victims, of course, of Zionism. Yeah. The Palestinian but, Arabs. But still, so I wonder what it is that you feel like... Draw, because obviously, I mean, as a historian, you're concerned with, I guess, the obje- objectivity and, and, and you would call it dry facts. But something drives you to, in a certain direction to be interested in something. I wonder what it is that drives you to research. Well, I, I think the of, truth is the thing which interests me, not justice, okay. but truth. In other words... I mean, I have my own views of what is just and what isn't, but that, that's not really what you'll find in the book. What you'll find in the book is an effort to get to the truth of what happened, what happened in certain places, what happened overall in the conflict, and so on. Um, and this, incidentally, is also what I, I think we, we've done, uh, myself and my fellow um, uh, author in this book on Turkey, is what we've tried to do with um, the tale of Turkey and its Christian minorities at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. We'll talk about it in a second, yeah. So you're saying, I guess, is it that you look for places that you feel are clouded in in myth, and you want to kind of bust through that and say, okay, let's find it. I wouldn't even say that. I'd simply like, I'd like to get the story straight. That's what interests me, to to get what is really true. And people were saying this about that, and other people were saying the opposite in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict or the creation of the refugee problem. The same applies to Turkey, if you like, and what happened to the Armenians or the Greeks or the Assyrians. There's this version, and I'd like to see what happened. So you go to the documents, you try and find out what the documents tell you happened, and then you present it. And that's what I, we did, I did in nine or ten books on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and what um, I've tried to do with my um, fellow author in the new book on the uh, Turkish problem. So maybe we'll talk a bit about, yeah. uh, can, we, can we say the name? Yeah, yeah, the name is, um, it's already been published, uh, that is the advertisement by Harvard University Press uh, in its uh, catalog for April when the book is supposed to come out it's published the name so that's it's all so it's on the, the record already um, the 30 year genocide yeah and uh, the, the, the subtitle is important Turkey's destruction of its Christian minorities 1894 1924 which are the Armenians? Or? Well, it's the Armenians, but also the Greeks and the Assyrians. Right. Everybody Assyrians. seems to focus on what happened to the Armenians during World War I, but the, the fact is it's a 30-year process and involves uh, Greeks, Armenians, and Assyrians. Not but the Armenians Armenians. were Christians. Armenians and Greeks okay. and Assyrians are all Christians, okay. yes. So the point of the... The point of what happened is the, the Turks were essentially interested in ex- getting rid of all their 
Christians, yeah. either by mu- murdering them or by expelling them, and that's what they did so in n- this 30-year period. So no flights <laughs> for you to Europe in, with a connection in Istanbul? I, in I don't next... think so. I think I'll have to skip yeah. Istanbul in the future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It's, it's, it's actually I mean, worse for my co-author. You like your head. It, on, on how co- yeah, yeah, I'd like to <laughs> remain attached, yeah. But, but, but um, it's worse for my... my, worse for my he's uh, Turkish. He's not Turkish, but he is a Ottomanist, and okay. he's always worked on Ottoman files, etc. Right. In Istanbul, he was even married to a Muslim Turk for a while. The kind who end up in the jail nowadays. Uh, we're probably worse than the jail. Maybe a bit like K- K- Khashoggi or whatever his name is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Buried yeah. in pieces in the garden. Yeah, yes, I, um, I, would not, I would not recommend either of us to visit Turkey in the <laughs> near future. Yeah. Okay. No, but it is, you know, it's quite an important issue. Even here in Israel, we debate about it from time to time. Maybe it will also help and push, because in Israel, we, ne- we never recognized, right, officially. Well, I don't think it's, I think Israel has been immoral in not uh, officially recognizing the Armenian genocide. But as I say, the genocide encompassed hundreds of thousands, maybe as many as a million Greeks and Assyrians, as well as a million yeah. Armenians. But do you use the word Holocaust in the book? No, the word is genocide. It's a, Never Holocaust. The Holocaust. Well, actually, the, the U, I was surprised to find in looking at the documents, and I've been doing this for the last eight, nine years, we've taken a long time to write this book, um, some American missionaries used the word Holocaust in relation to the Armenians in the sense of what the Holocaust actually means. It means a large fire, a conflagration. That's what the word means. In English? No, in Greek. It's a Greek word, it's a Greek, uh, which is used cool. in English, but it means a, a fire, a large fire. Really? And the, the, Amer- the, Armenia, the American missionaries used it because the Turks quite often put hundreds or thousands of Armenians in churches and burnt them. Right. And this was called Jesus. a holocaust. Also, yeah. Also, then the Nazis place. did the same. No, they didn't. The Nazi, well, some people did the same, but yeah. the Nazis essentially either shot people or gassed them. Yeah, but there were. There were, there were places were, where yeah. people were burnt, but often, in the, by, in the often by Ukrainians and Poles right. rather than yeah. Germans. The Germans didn't actually, I don't think, go ahead and burn people in synagogues. What they did was they assembled them and took them to yeah. camps it's and too, killed them or get them and Germans killed them. To just uh, burn it up. was more orderly, yeah. but it's true yeah. that in Yedbavne and places like that in Poland, the locals... It mustered the people in a, a synagogue and then burnt them. Yeah, yeah, true. yeah, yeah. So can you give us a little bit of a rundown? Give us the 30-year genocide in 30 seconds. No, I'm kidding. But give us, get, can you tell us, seconds. What, I mean, what happened specifically with each community, with the Armenians, with well, the Greeks, and with the Assyrians? It's, 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 it's complicated and quite simple. The successive Ottoman Turkish governor, governments between 1894 and 1924 wanted to get rid of their Christian minorities because they regarded the minorities as destabilizing potential knife-in-the-back fifth columnists, uh, and they wanted a pure Turkish Muslim state. That's what they wanted. This is what Abdul Hamid wanted, the sultan, uh, in the 1890s. This is what the CUP, or Young Turks, wanted during World War I, and this is what Ataturk wanted in the period 1919-1924. And to this end, they in, uh, staggered bouts of massacre and expulsion and forced conversion of tens of thousands of people uh, and mass rape also uh, uh, and abduction of women also in their tens of thousands, they uh, essentially got rid of their three large um, Christian communities. Nobody knows the exact numbers, but probably there were initially in 1890 two million Armenians, two million Greeks, and about 600,000 Assyrians living in the area we call Turkey today. Uh, and they essentially got rid of them. They were 20% of Turkey's population in 1890. They were less than 2% of uh, Turkey's population in 1924. Got rid? Killed? When they you were, say- well, no, they did both. They both killed large and numbers expelled. and they expelled large numbers. With the Armenians, they probably killed more and expelled less. And with the Greeks, they expelled more of them and killed less. But we're talking in the hundreds of thousands of m- murdered people so in both why? cases. Uh, and in the Armenians, Assyrians. almost a million, you said. Well, uh, Maybe, probably perhaps. a million. Over the 30-year period, it's probably a million Armenians. It's probably something less in Greek terms of the Greeks, and it's probably about 300,000 in terms of the Assyrians. Why? Because they didn't want Christians. The Christians were the other. They wanted a Muslim state. They regarded the Christians as infidels. They regarded the Christians as potential uh, allies of external Christian powers, which were inimical to Turkey, the Mm -hmm. Russians especially, but also the British and the French. Um, They wanted their property. 
and they stole all their property, which was enormous. Mm-hmm. All Greek and Turk and Armenian property and Assyrian property uh, fell into the hands of the state or individual Turks. Many Turks wanted the women to rape them, to take them as uh, abductees into their houses, concubines, servants, uh, slaves, whatever this you is, want. This is also under Ataturk's rule. Yes. Ataturk is seen yes. kind of as I the know. modernizer he's, of Turkey, he's right? He's seen as a modern enlightened European yeah. who, tries cool to, in, yes, who tries to turn uh, Turkey into a Western country. Mm-hmm. He changes the, the script from Arabic well, into Latin and so on. But he was uh, as much genocidal and uh, expulsive as his predecessor. Well, if genocide is an European thing, this is... A, I didn't say, no, it's not European. No, it's not true. <laughs> genocide is something which has been going on for th- thousands of years. Right. The Babylonians well, did it, the Assyrians did it, the Egyptians did it. They killed peoples they conquered or turned them into slaves. Uh, and and uh, the Jews in, mo- did it. in modern days, yeah, and right. probably the Jews did seem to have done something. Or at least we have genocidal some, aspirations. They did things like that to the Amalekites and the yeah. Edomites, perhaps, uh, in ancient times, if you right. believe what's in the Bible or whatever. But anyhow... <laughs> um, so why, why is it that this story is so untalked about? No, well, in the 20th century, people gradually, during the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, Europeans became more cultured and less violent. That's what happened. In the Middle Ages, everybody was violent. Uh, They became less violent as the Whig interpretation of history progressed, as liberals became, uh, and liberalism became the dominant ethos. You're supposed to behave nicely. The Turks didn't behave nicely, um, and um, they didn't aspire to behave nicely, and the Germans, of course, were a big aberration. They were the most unnice people around during uh, Hitler's day. But, but the Turks did this, and they also got a terrible name. They were called the Terrible Turks as a result of massacring Christians in Bulgaria and later in Turkey itself. And is it a coincidence that they ended up teaming with the Germans in World War I, for example? Like, well, some uh, people say it wasn't a coincidence because the Germans had already been slaughtering people in South uh, West Africa uh, before. Um, 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 so culture, like so, but some people attribute this. I, I don't know. Okay, I, I I I don't know if this is true, but there 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 were charges, and there were people. There were a lot of German advisors in Turkey during what happened in World War One to the Armenians, and some of them advised to get rid of the Armenians, or at least uh, looked the other way as Armenians were being massacred. Right, um, uh, and uh, but it's interesting to note that one of the German consuls in Turkey, one of the um, Uh, towns, provincial towns, was a man who actually died alongside uh, Hitler, who was killed in the Berlin, the Munich Putsch in 1923, when uh, Hitler tried to get power, achieve power in Bavaria, and mounted the sort of uh, rebellion. Uh, One of the consuls um, from, uh, of uh, one of the German consuls in Turkey, we'd been in Turkey before, died. He was shot by German police. But this consul actually was constantly reporting against the Turks and their de- destruction of Armenians in World War I. And later he becomes a Nazi. Ah, I see. And he was <laughs> killed by the Germans. Yes, by Germans who were opposed to the Nazis. Ah, by I the see. German police in Munich. Yeah, yeah. So he sort of crosses the, the, the lines. He, uh, and he's opposed to the Armenian killing of, mass killing of Armenians by the Turks, who are Germany's allies in World War I. And then when he gets back to Germany, he becomes a Nazi and uh, su- presumably suppo- supports Nazi ideals of yeah. cleansing Germany. So why do you, why do you think the... But that's a, that's a, you yeah, know, that's yeah. a side why, thing. It's why do you think interesting? Why do you think the Israeli government has such a, an issue? Is it because of the 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 well, it's like Turkey. Turkey is the is the closest Muslim country we have? So I don't know about closest Muslim country, but it's 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 a, an important a Muslim country in the Middle East. It's not Arab, so potentially it could be an ally against Arabs, or at least not pro Arab. But at the moment, or the last decade or so, it has turned pro-Arab under this uh, ruling party, under Erdogan. Uh, but it, Israel still, for apparently for strategic and economic reasons, doesn't want to offend the Turks over much, and therefore doesn't recognize and now the Armenian... Now Professor Morris is going single-handedly ruin the relationship of no, Israel no, and Turkey. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the Erdogan is a listener. The rela- exactly. The relations between Israel and Turkey are poor. And Erdogan continuously says he supports the Hamas and Israel is evil and so on. Do we really have that that much of a strategic? I don't know. I don't know. I, I think there are things we don't know about. Okay. I think there are intelligence things and military things we don't know about, which stay 
Netanyahu's hand from cutting off relations with Turkey. I, when I do... personally would have cut relations off with Turkey a long time ago and said, you don't like us? Okay, we don't have to have relations with you. But, uh, we can, we, but morally speaking, we should recognize the Armenian genocide because that's the sort of thing we would like people to recognize yeah. w- what happened to us. And those who don't accept the Holocaust, we're doing the same thing in that sense with the Armenians and with yeah. the Greeks and the Assyrians. Did you have to travel to Turkey to look through archives? I, I didn't. Like that? Uh, my, my partner, who's an Ottomanist, did. Drawers heavy went through the. It uh, is Turkey. dangerous. Also, Turkey. no, 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 right? no, no. It's no, it's, it's, it's not a complete dictatorship. Turkey. It's sort of. It's some. It straddles a fence between democracy and dictatorship. And at the moment, foreigners are usually not uh, uh, prevented from seeing uh, documents. But the point is that the Turks basically have purged their archives. So you don't actually see much incriminating material in Turkish archives. But there is a lot of supplementary material there which sort of supports what the Westerners uh, who were uh, in Turkey in 19, around 1900, the British consuls, the German consuls, American consuls, missionaries from the various countries, Turkish documents support right. their version of what and happened in one way or another. Are you going to publish it in Turkish? I don't know. We don't have a contract with Turkey at the moment. <laughs> no, we we have a contract in English. We have a contract in Italian. It'll come out in Italian probably first. Um, I hope it'll come out in Turkey because it's good. The Turks know uh, know their, their history. history. Would yeah. that actually? I mean, that, are there books in Turkish about the Armenian genocide? I don't know. You know what? I don't know. I think a lot of Turks, some Turks, some Turkish historians have written about it. The books have been published in English. I don't know whether they've actually been published. In, in Turkish, Turkish. Uh, my my partner would know. Drawer knows exactly what's in Turkish. I don't know. Is this an attempt to, uh, I guess, rename the Armenian genocide? No, no, kind of saying a, no, no, the Armenian a, genocide is forgetting a whole other million people. Uh, well, uh, that's true. Uh, we didn't know that when we started out. We were going to write a a, a new look at the Armenian genocide. At what happened? Why? But, because it interested us. Because, okay. as I said, it was controversial. We wanted to sort out the facts from the fiction. Okay. What is the true story of what happened? But as we got into it, we saw it's a much longer and deeper story. Mm-hmm. It's a 30-year story, not a two-year story. And it involves other peoples as well, Greeks and Assyrians, and various um, not successive uh, Turkish governments, not just one government. Um, so it's essentially... Turkish policy over those 30 years, not just one aberration by some colonels who were running the government in Mm -hmm. 1915. Before we go, Professor, I have to ask you this. Uh, Why did you sit in jail in 88? Because (laughs) I refused to serve in the IDF uh, as a reservist. Why? Why? It's a curveball. (laughs) Well, the first, no, it's not. The first intifada... Uh, was different from the Second Intifada. You grew up maybe remembering the Second Intifada. Yeah, we know maybe. nothing about the First. The First Intifada you don't know anything about. So from 1987 until 1991, the Arabs in the West Bank and Gaza essentially wanted to throw off the yoke of Israeli military government in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. They may have also in their hearts wanted something beyond that just to get rid of the Israelis from where we're you know, sitting on top of them. But th- there are Official stance was this is against military occupation and its burdens and its uh, trials and tribulations, and we we will we want to be free, and um, I I thought that was quite legitimate. Uh, I, I understand why Israel has been in occupation of the Arab territories, Palestinian territories since 1967. We had nobody to give them to. We were willing to trade, but they weren't willing to trade. That was how it was under the Labour Party. It isn't the situation today, but but uh, at the time I thought uh, they have a legitimate grievance, and I'm certainly not going to take part in suppressing a popular uh, revolt, which wasn't an armed, lethal revolt. It was basically using uh, stones and protests and uh, uh, strikes. And uh, but didn't I mean people did die? No, yes, but not first... very many, very few. About a thousand Palestinians died, and maybe several dozen Israelis. Uh, and there were a few Hamasniks who were shooting people, but this was rare. It was the yeah. exception. During the first intifada, it was basically a civil it was a peaceful, revolt. Peaceful it was semi semi peaceful revolt, but non lethal. That's the point. The second intifada was very lethal. Thirteen, fourteen hundred Israelis died, um, uh, and there was a lot of shooting and killing and uh, bombing, etc., etc. And the point in the second intifada was that you felt that it wasn't just to get, throw off the Israeli military occupation, it was basically to get rid of Israel as well. That's what they really wanted, to destabilize Israel and make it uh, disappear in some way. 
it wasn't a realistic aim, but but you, you could sense that, and it was also spearheaded by the Hamas. Whereas the first uh, the first Intifada wasn't spearheaded by the Hamas. The Hamas was a ma marginal a participant. It was essentially a Fatah a, a, a campaign. So would you approve an objector nowadays? No. Uh -huh. Because I think the thing has moved to a different stage in which it is really, for the Palestinians, um, a struggle to get rid of Israel as well as to get rid of the occupation. Even though they, of course, stress we want to get rid of the occupation, they're essentially aiming further than that. They're aiming at Tel Aviv, Haifa. But now um, you say that they always were like that, right? Yeah, but it didn't seem so during the first intifada. Right. I'm saying that historically speaking, the Palestinian national movement wants to get rid of the Israeli Zionist national movement. So and, were you and wrong to, to object, in your opinion? <laughs> well, no, yeah, you have to put you have to put yourself in people's shoes in a specific set of circumstances, and no, in those specific uh, set of circumstances, no, 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 no. Yeah. they weren't shooting at us. We were killing Palestinians who were throwing rocks, which essentially didn't endanger anybody. Maybe one or two people died from rocks, but not much more than that. Um, and we were killing large numbers of them. Uh, so I thought that was wrong. Okay. Fair enough. So, so before we go, we have a collaboration, as we were telling you, with the Jewish Journal, uh, jewishjournal.com. Um, they are a news source out in L.A. Uh, they have great columns, so check them out. Yes. Um, and uh, we accept donations, so guys, go to 2NJB.com slash donate and help us out, uh, please, because we do it on our free time. And, and of course, check out Benny Morris's yes. books. It, the new book is coming out in English. In April. In April, uh, and all the other books, um, we'll and you can check out also his lectures online. There's right. some lectures. Okay. I don't know if they're legally online, but you can check them out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make any profits. So it's probably illegal. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, check out Benny Morris. We urge very interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much. Guys, we do videos now, so you can watch it. You can watch us. <laughs> so check it out on our Facebook and YouTube. And that is it. Thank you so much, Professor My Morris. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.